Hello everyone and welcome to Daily News Simplified, your one-stop solution to detailed analysis of current affairs which are published in the daily edition of the Hindu newspaper. Articles dated 16th December 2022 are listed on your screen and the time stamping along with the notes in PDF and Word format are given in the description box. But before moving to the first article for the day, there are two important announcements to be made. The first one is with respect to the prelims test series. Prelims is just 163 days for now. In order to write a good test and get good score, you need to go into the practice mode. Rao's IAS has started the prelims test series for you to join and make a good out of this course. The second announcement is with respect to the political science and international relations mains test series for 2023 examination. In order to get good revision, higher test scores and write feedback for your preparation, do join this test series. The descriptions and the links for both these announcements are given in the description box. So now let us start with the first article for the day. This article of the Hindu newspaper appeared on first page as a lead article for today's DNS discussion. The article says that China is now building ropeway roads near the tri junction. Although the article talks about the tri junction, but it is not technically the exact tri junction between India, China, and Bhutan. The article says that China has been building a ropeway near the Torsa Nala, it's a drain, its own side. But this side is close to the India, Bhutan and China Tri Junction. Tri Junction is a position where the border of these three countries meet. And because of this infrastructural development, it is going to strengthen its position in the eastern section of India. The relevance of the article from the prelims perspective is with respect to the map locations. In the GS paper 1 mains examination, geographical location questions could be put up. In GS Paper 2, India's bilateral relations with neighbors, where this point could be quoted. And in your national security and the issues on the border in your GS Paper 3, this question could be asked. Border related essay was once asked by the UPSC in the previous mains examination. Today, in much detail, we are going to talk about the locational discussion of this area, that is the Chumbi Valley, Doklam region and the western part of Arunachal Pradesh. Why China is building such infrastructure on India's border? Benefits of such infrastructure development to China? Concerns associated to India? What India has done in the past to solve the issue but why it remains unresolved and what should be the ideal way forward will be part of today's discussion. So let's start with the location of map first. As you can see, these are the important areas which are disputed between India, China and Pakistan. So today our focus is going to be on China. So there are certain regions across India's border except Sikkim. So China has claimed territory in Ladakh, in Himachal Pradesh, in Uttarakhand and in Arunachal Pradesh. Few years back, China through an agreement agreed to consider Sikkim as India's integral part. Hence, there is no border dispute on Sikkim. Otherwise, all other territories, including three states and one union territory that share borders with China, have disputed territories. Today's discussion is based on the development of infrastructure on the western front of Arunachal Pradesh, as you can see on the map. Along with that, China is also building infrastructure on the borders which are close to Bhutan and near the tri-junction of Sikkim. If we go in the closer map, as you can see, this is the particular area of Doklam where in 2017 there was a clashes between the Chinese forces and the Indian forces because Indians actually objected the road building of China in this area. The western boundary of Bhutan is claimed by China to be its own territory as if China is no longer having enough land to survive. Now China is claiming the western part of Bhutan so as to get more control over this territory. Why? The reason is very straightforward. The area or the Chumbi Valley which lie in this tri-junction is a flat region. 
and india and bhutan are on the hilly areas the country which is having control over the hilly area will definitely have more control over that country which is on the lower part and that is the reason why china claims this region to be its own doklang region or the doklang in chinese is a 100 square kilometer region and it is surrounded by the chumbi valley of tibet and bhutan's ha valley now india is curious about this development on the eastern border both arunachal pradesh and the tri junction because of chicken snack or siliguri corridor now if we go through this map as you can see this is an important region known by the term siliguri corridor it's a very narrow strip of area that connect mainland india to the northeast india if tomorrow china builds up a large infrastructure and block this particular area of india the india won't be able to have manifest its control over northeastern region and that might create a war like situation so india would like to have better control over this region and control chinese presence as much as possible apart from the chumbi valley and doklam plateau tawang is the one region where china is claiming its territorial rights Tawang is the southern part of Tibet and historically remained the part of Tibet region but as India was under the British East India Company later on the British crown the British government signed a treaty known as Shimla agreement with Tibet in which China did not participated China was itself under the imperial control during that phase so when china was under the imperial control how can china say that tibet have no rights over that agreement both tibet and china were different back then they had different political setup and they have different international agreements however china has denied the macmohan line which was signed after the shimla agreement and this is the macmohan line on which india claims arunachal pradesh now if we go into the deeper side As you can see this is your Doklam region the area where the conflict was there in 2017 the shaded green portion on the screen shows the territory which is claimed by China but lies in Bhutan however Bhutan has not accepted this so according to India the shaded portion is part of Bhutan so A1 is the real tri junction but according to China shaded portion is part of china so a2 would be the area of tri junction and this has remained a conflict between both these country that what should be the tri junction where india china and bhutan border is getting intermixed now please imagine this if tomorrow a2 becomes the part or the tri junction for china don't you think that china will enter deeper into india's territory and it will be more closer to siliguri corridor and that is the reason why india and bhutan are doing their best to keep a1 as the important tri junction point between these three countries now let's go beyond the article why china is building infrastructure what benefit does it lie to china to build such kind of infrastructure in india's northeastern region the first is that china is planning to cover india from oil sides it's like a chakra view from mahabharat where the enemy try to capture its target from all the sides so that the target have no chance to get an escape so through bri belt and road initiative or any other initiative china is trying to bring out its presence across india's border and even in the oceans through port and coastal development the second is that china want to dilute india's good reputation or rep repo in south asia especially among nepal and bhutan So in Nepal already there is anti India sentiment since the changing of the regime and the new constitution especially with respect to the madheshi issue while Bhutan remains one of the all weather friend of India but China wants to downgrade that reputation that India holds if China gets successful in getting these two countries on its side India would be left helpless to control the northeastern region through the penetration of chinese presence The third is that if China keeps on building different infrastructural points 
These points will give China the upper hand in case of full-fledged war. Presence of infrastructure means that they can get permanent standing army. Permanent standing army means whatever may be the situation, whether it is a war or a peace, it will create or it will pose a continuous threat to the enemy nation. If China is building road, they will create quarters also. They will station thousands of Chinese PLA army personnel. If India does not have thousands of army men on the borders, India is automatically losing the war on its side. Chinese forces, if they remain on the borders throughout the year because of this infrastructure, they can patrol the border area throughout the year. And that is the reason why this will keep China more intelligence on India's border area. They might even start influencing the Indians who are living in the border area. They might also start infiltrating drugs and counterfeit currency along with the weapons on India's border. And lastly, better infrastructure will help China to meet, meet its logistic demand to the South Asian countries, including Nepal, China and even to Myanmar. But the question arises that what does it give India a threat? The concern to India lies is that in comparison to China, India's infrastructure push is very limited. Hardly 25% of the projects are yet completed and 75% are pending for more than 5 years. China and India are both nuclear nations. And since the ending of the Second World War, it has seen that no two countries or no two nuclear powers have come to a war. Whether you talk about India or Pakistan, since the advent of nuclear weapons with these two countries, they have never fought a full-fledged war. The same is true with India-China, the same is true with US or USSR. Nuclear power countries do not fight a full-fledged war. But India's military preparedness is below that of China. If they get into the war, there are little chances that India might end up victory. So as of now, what India should do, India should focus more on building up its military preparedness. Most of India's areas lies close to the Chinese border are in the low altitude. Whether you talk about the Ganga Valley. So Ganga Valley is far lower than that of Chinese Tibetan Plateau. And this gives the advantage to the Chinese forces on its own. But the case of Doklam is different as we have discussed previously. Chinese economy is far more and larger and vibrant than the Indian economy. They have more money to employ and develop infrastructure on its border. So India should not compare on that regard. India's largest population lives closer to the border areas. I'll give you the example of Ganga Valley again. So Ganga Valley is far closer to China than what Chinese population is to Tibet. If you go by the world map, you'll find that the plain part of China lies in the easternmost section, which is almost 1000 to 2000 kilometers away from Tibet itself. On the other hand, if China comes closer to India's border, they can easily target the entire Ganga Yamuna belt, which is very high in population density. And the last one is Indian territories are prone to the foreign attack due to the locational vulnerability like Siliguri corridor, which is a very small area. And if there is a destability in this corridor, it might create law and order situation in the Northeast as well. Now, it seems that India and China are not doing anything to resolve the issue. But that is not the case. It was in 1914 when Shimla agreement was signed between British India and Tibet. Tibet back then was not under the Chinese government because China itself was under the colonialism. Both of them signed and demarcate a border known by the name Mac Mohan Line, which is actually respected by India but not by China. China says that Tibet was not a sovereign country in 1914 so any agreement signed by Tibet does not hold any relevance. In 1954, after 40 years and the independence of both the countries, they signed the Panchashil Agreement, in which they agreed to respect each other's sovereignty and territorial integrity. But it could only last for six years. In 1962, Indochina war was fought and India lost much of its area in Ladakh region in the hands of China. And after almost three decades, both the countries came together, formed a joint working group 
for CBM or confidence building measures to solve the border dispute as soon as possible in mutually decided manner. But nothing has done even since then. In 1993, Prime Minister Narasimha Rao visited China and signed the Agreement for Peace and Tranquility along the LAC. However, nothing since then has been occurred. Although the conflict, if compared to India's border with Pakistan, are very less. But whenever there was a conflict or the trespassing by the Chinese forces, there was hits and misses on both the sides. A headway was achieved in 2003. Special representatives were appointed to resolve the border conflict ASAP. In the same year, there was a declaration which was signed for the comprehensive cooperation for bilateral agreement in the future, exchange of maps between the two countries and these maps should not be the wrong maps or the wrong cartography. And after the proper discussion, there will be the final demarcation of the borders. So this three step solution was decided in 2003, but nothing happened since then. In 2012, last major initiative was taken, which is almost a decade old now, where a working mechanism for consultation and coordination was signed in order to go into the functioning of the above three points, but still nothing has been resolved. So going by the diplomatic manner, it seems that India and China are not likely to resolve the issue. Then what should be the ideal way forward? India should not take China very lightly. If China is building the infrastructure, India should not be left behind. India should start deploying the forces for the time being because manpower is the one where India is no less than Chinese forces. They should deploy the latest technology to keep the surveillance and the development status of China. They should also install the missile system just to provide the threat perception to the Chinese authorities so that they cannot take any adventurous step against India's establishment. In the past, India has already used Brahmo's missile system targeting the Chinese authorities, although not used at all. At the same time, India should look into the faster development of the infrastructure project. All the pending projects should be completed as soon as possible. And the continuation of the diplomatic channel through the back doors should also continue as we have seen in the previous discussion where all these important decisions were taken and they should continue in the future as well. So whether we talk about the strategic decision, military decision or the diplomatic decision should be used in a combined format in order to resolve the Indochina border disputes in the future. With this discussion please let us now move to the next article for the day. This article of the Hindu newspaper appeared on the business page and talks about that how India's important capital market index Sensex has fell by 1.4%. Rupee has also depreciated because of the hawkish US Fed decision. Now hawkish US Fed decision simply means that US Fed or the Federal Reserve which is also the central bank like we have Reserve Bank of India. So the US Fed or the US Central Bank has been hawkish means that they have increased the policy rates by 50 basis point. Now today we are going to look into the basic phenomena of how the interest rate in different market impact Indian inflation and India's trade. Now, understanding of these concepts is important for your prelim examination because in the prelims, UPSC can ask questions with respect to how economic concepts are associated in the international affairs. So what is the basic background? So the basic background says that US is going through a high inflation. Previously, it was close to nine. However, it has come down to seven. But still, according to US market, where inflation usually remains around 1 to 2%, 7% is still very high. Now, higher inflation simply means that there is more demand in the economy than the supply. Now, in order to control the demand, what government or central bank can do? They can reduce down the availability of money with people. More money means more demand. Now, when money is less, people will demand less and there will be 
equality in the demand and supply now when money will be less with people when the cost of money will be high when money will be expensive people will spend less now how money can be expensive money can be expensive if cost of money is high and cost of money is rate of interest higher the rate of interest means higher would be the price of loan that a person get from the bank so what federal reserve has done they have increased the policy interest rate by 50 basic point that means 0.5% so if it was 1% previously it will be 1.5 if it was 4% previously it will be 4.5 in the previous DNS, I have discussed about how the basic point actually determines the interest rate. Now, when the Federal Reserve has raised the policy interest rate, or it simply means that all the commercial banks will be forced to raise their specific interest rate. Higher the interest rate means the, there will be more cost of money. More cost of money simply means that there will be lesser the demand, higher the supply. And this will reduce down the gap between demand and supply in the US economy. But what impact does it have on India? When the policy interest rate are higher, it simply means that investing in US, let's say you want to open a fixed deposit. Now previously you were reluctant to open a fixed deposit in US. But now the interest rate that you are getting is 0.5% more. Hence you will be getting 50 paisa on every every 100 rupee that you are going to invest. Now, it will be profitable for you to invest in the US than investing in India. So people who are making investment will now be making investment in the US to make more profit out of higher interest rate. Higher interest rate will begin outflow of capital from India. So those people who were investing in the BSC or Bombay Stock Exchange will now be spending or investing more in the Dow Jones or the US markets. So there will be outflow of capital from India. Outflow of capital from India means that people who want to invest in the US market will demand money. Because as a citizen of India, if you want to invest in US, you cannot invest in Indian rupee. To invest in US, you require US dollar. So people will demand more dollar vis-a-vis -vis rupees to make investment in US. This will create higher demand of dollar. Then the demand of dollar will be more than supply of dollar in Indian economy. Higher demand of foreign currency means the foreign currency will appreciate and consequently the domestic currency will depreciate. So US dollar will appreciate and rupee will depreciate and that is the reason why because of the higher interest rate in US, 27 paisa was the depreciation reserved in the Indian rupee. Now the cycle does not end here. There is more to go. Now once there is a more demand of dollar and less supply of dollar, there will be the appreciation of dollar, depreciation of rupee. That means Indian rupee will now be more cheaper. More cheaper the domestic currency means more exports will be there. Now, if a company is exporting a particular good, they are going to get more rupee because rupee has depreciated. But now if you want to spend in buying something from outside, let's say a person wants to buy a car from US. Now, as dollar is more, rupee is less. So person is supposed to pay more rupee per dollar to buy imports. So what will happen? Exports become profitable. Imports become expensive. Consequently, there will be more trade deficit because exports will be overpowered by imports. More imports, less exports. Every good that we are importing will be expensive. Let's take the example of oil. India is among the largest importer of oil. So more expensive the oil is, more will be the price of petrol and diesel that India is importing. More prices of petrol and diesel simply equates towards the rising inflation because everything that we consume has more or less associated with the transportation cost in which fuel price is very, very important. And ultimately, it will lead to the rising inflation. And here also, consequently, the RBI is going to increase 
the policy rates in India. So this is what I will conclude as the integration of different economies at the global level. And that is the reason when one market in the world goes under the depression or recession, other markets also face the same issues. With this discussion, please, let us now move to the next article for the day. This article of the Hindu newspaper appeared on page 7 and talks about a recent action taken by the Tamil Nadu government belonging to the auction of an important Nataraj idol. And this idol was being auctioned in France at a price of almost 2.5 crore rupees. Now, why Tamil Nadu government has taken such an initiative? The reason being that this idol belongs to the Vijayanagar Empire from 15th to 16th century. So first of all, this is a heritage and it is a cultural heritage belonging to Indian medieval history. So from the same perspective, we are going to discuss about the relevance of Nataraj idols that are found in the medieval Indian history. Now, if you go through this particular image, Nataraj is the another name or a synonym used for Lord Shiva and his dancing position. Now, when we say Nataraj, it simply means that there is a depiction of Lord Shiva, as you can see on the screen, in a dancing position. But this does not only shows what dancing means in Indian mythology, it also means that what Lord Shiva is depicting through these important sculptures. Now the Nataraj sculpture actually began popularizing as a period between 9th to 13th century. Now this period in a place known as Tanjavur or areas around Tamil Nadu was known to be under the control of Imperial Chol. Now there are two Chol dynasties. First is the classical Chol that belongs to the early era of ancient India. The second one belongs to the medieval Indian history that is the Imperial Chol. The reason they are known as Imperial is because they are the first or the foremost dynasty from India that ruled beyond the oceans. So they first colonized Sri Lanka. They also had presence in Southeast Asia including the islands of Indonesia and that is the reason why they are known as Imperial Chol. However, the concept of Nataraj was not evolved during the Chol dynasty. The concept of Nataraj or Lord Shiva in a dancing position actually evolved in the part of 15th century in and around the Deccan India. The metal sculpture that you are seeing on the screen is a symbolic and a synonym used with the imperial Chol. The metal which was used in Creating this sculpture was bronze and the technique which was used was the lost wax technique. This is the same technique that was highlighted or used by the people of Indus Valley civilization for the creation of dancing girl. Now when we talk about the lost wax technique, it is very easy. First of all, the artist will create a sculpture of wax. Then that sculpture of wax will be covered with terracotta. Then the given wax will be melted. Now the entire structure of terracotta will be hollowed from inside. There will be no wax as it was drained out because of the high temperature. The leftover hollow part of the terracotta structure will then be filled with the liquid or the molten metal. And in this case, it was bronze. So bronze will be filled up in that structure. And after the cooling down of the metal, we are going to get a defined sculpture in a particular metal. And this is what is known as lost wax technique. The purpose of creating Natraj was to show the image of Shiva and his role as creator, preserver and the destroyer of the universe. So this is the basic mythology behind Lord Shiva depicting as Nataraj. The second purpose was to convey that India has concept of never ending cycle of time. So as you can see around the entire Lord Shiva, there is a hollow and this hollow shows the continuity or a never ending cycle of time. Now talking about the important features. 
The first important feature is that Shiva's dance is set within the flaming halo. So the flaming halo that you are seeing, it shows the fire. In his upper right hand, you can see there is a Damru. Damru is a musical instrument which was used by Lord Shiva. On his upper left hand, there is Agni. As you can see over here, this is Agni or flame which is used to light up the entire halo. On his lower right hand, there is Abhay Mudra. And to your information, the same mudra was also shown to be used by Gautam Buddha under Gandhar art and Mathura art. On the right foot, there is a drop under his leg. And this drop actually represents Apasmar Purush or the illusion, Maya, the concept of Maya used within Buddhism. So this is an illusion which leads to mankind astray. So because of this drop or because of this Apasmar Purush, there is the mental instability among the humans. Hence, a person should try to keep the Maya under his feet. This energy of the dance makes his hair fly to the side as you can see on the screen. And the entire symbolism of the structure shows that the belief that people have in Shiva will allow them or the devotees to achieve the salvation. So, conquering of draft will ultimately lead to this salvation according to the Natraj sculpture. With this discussion in place, let us now move to the next article for the day. This article of the Hindu newspaper is part of the editorial section. And here, the newspaper has published a debate on the functioning of Right to Information Act that whether this act has fulfilled its purpose or not. So today we are not going to discuss about the RTI that has already been discussed a lot of time in the DNS and link to all those DNS is provided in the description below. You can follow those links to understand more about the RTI Act. Even we have covered the RTI Act in the focus and the Compass magazine very very thoroughly. So you can follow and download the Compass and the Focus magazine from the Elan platform of Rao's IES to understand more about the RTI Act. So we have discussed all the important dimension of this Act in length and breadth. The relevance of RTI is straightforward. In your GS Paper 2, it is forming a part under the Governance section. And in your GS Paper 4, RTI can well be asked under the Ethics or Ethical Governance. In previous year question, if you go by this basic understanding of UPSC, you will find that in GS Paper 2, in 2020, RTI Related Amendment Act was asked and in 2019, it was asked in your GS Paper 4, that is Ethics Paper, that whether RTI is having any relevance with respect to Official Secret Act or not. So from the perspective of this examination, this article is extremely, extremely important. So today, as we have said that we have already covered the RTI in length and breadth in the previous DNS. For example, on 12th of October, we have covered the basic amendments brought by the government recently. And on 13th March last year, we have covered all the important dimensions with respect to GS Paper 2 and GS Paper 4 in the DNS. So today we are going to look into the basic debate on which this article was framed. So article has stated that RTI has helped Indians in multiple ways. The first is that it has provided entitlement and rights. So previously, if a citizen had to ask the government whether he or she can be provided information or not, government could easily deny that information. Now there is a time bound duty of the government to provide the information to the citizen when it is demanded. So this is a right. If this right is violated, a person can approach the legal means available under this act. The second one is it has provided an avenue to the citizen to hold high the offices to account. So it has raised the accountability standard in Indian governance system. Since the rolling out of RTI, citizens have got a tool, a weapon to ask the officers as well as their political representatives that why a particular service was not being delivered to them on time. Not only that, it has also allowed the people to get 
or reveal the important information with respect to the governance. Now, being a citizen and being a taxpayer, a person should know that whether his money is being spent on the right development or the welfare schemes or not, whether the tax which he or she has paid is being spent on the corrupt practices or not. If the money of the taxpayer is being paid or is being utilized for the corrupt practices, RTI can help in bringing down that information to the public notice. The next one is that through the same information, RTI has helped citizens to find out about the corrupt practices in the different governments. For example, the Adarsh scam with respect to the residential society or the Commonwealth scam in which prices of certain goods and services was intentionally inflated to siphon off the legal money. So such kind of scams could be possibly exposed because of the right to information. The next one is it has exposed the human right violation especially in those areas where the security forces have upper hand with respect to the controlling of law and order. So for example in the Union Territory of Jammu and Kashmir or in, the, in some of the states in the Northeast India, security forces have more powers. And even in other states, even the police department sometimes violate basic human rights of the citizens. And right to information can help citizens identify what rights they are enjoying and whether these rights were violated or not. The act has also helped the civil societies and the public spirited persons. With that information that they get from the public authorities, they can go with the writ petitions. This writ petitions in Supreme Court and the High Court has helped them to bring government to justice, to bring government in action and to make government accountable to their promises. And lastly, through RTI, people have come across the information that how many people are actually involved in the crimes. So previously, what was the basic practice was that whenever a person filed an affidavit to the election commission while standing for the candidature or while for going to contest in the election, providing their criminal records, they would never be made public. Now through right to information, this sensitive information about a particular candidate is now made public and citizens who are going to vote to a particular candidate will have now information with respect to whether the candidate was involved in a particular crime previously or not. Now let's talk about the basic constraint which people face while filing the RTI. See we are not judging the act itself. The article has actually talked about whether people have awareness with respect to this law or not. The first is lack of awareness. There are large number of people across India who are illiterate with respect to the civic duties. So when they don't have duties, when they don't know about the basic fundamental right, it is very hard for them to understand about the awareness on whether they can seek the information from the government or not. The second is that they, there is a lack of expertise in framing the question on the complex issues. Now people sometimes require information to be conveyed to them, but they do not know how to question the authorities with respect to the information. They sometimes might ask the questions in a very layman language which might not be answered by the authorities or might not be taken as a serious information discharge. There is a lack of homogeneity in the rules. So the rules which is part of the duty of the administration may differ from state to state. So states have been differing with respect to the information being provided in a particular language in a particular format. So a person demanding information in Kerala may get the different information with that the one who is demanding in the state of Uttarakhand. Then comes the issues from the government side. So the public information officer who is responsible to provide the first hand information on demand under the RTI may find dubious ways. For example, he might remain absent. They might not consider the application. They might return or may not provide the application form to the particular citizen in the first place. So through these ways, they try to bring down the number of applications being filed under this act. 
there is a lack of information on certain accounts as well most of the time it has been found that the record keeping by the government is not sufficient once the records are not being prepared how a public information officer can provide information to the citizens let's say a citizen has approached with an application to know that how much money was spent by the government on a particular project but when money was being spent the entire record was not maintained with respect to the expenditure when record is missing so is the information being provided to the person then there is an increasing threat to the life of rti activists especially those who want to unearth the corrupt practices it has been found that many people and authorities using muscle and power have been seen or involved in killing of or murdering the rti activists in the past then there is an ineffective record management system as most of the information even the minute details are not being maintained the pios or the faas are not adequately trained to handle the large number of applications which they receive there is an increased workload on the pios there are certain departments which might have more information for example the accounts department but the number of pios allocated to the each department sometimes remain one or not even one and that has increased the workload on the existing pios then there is increasing rti appeals as the number of people are getting more aware about the utilization of the rti the number of rti application are being on the increasing the information commissioners are becoming parking lots of the retired bureaucrats so most of the governments at the state level have been utilizing the retired bureaucrats to act as a information commissioners and this information commissioners are now being sitting idle on the large number of applications because they are taking it as more like a post retirement benefit the entire system need digitization most of the information does not get into the hands of the people just because finding the information in a pen and paper format is very hard sometimes the information may not be available at a single point so a person had to travel to distant places to get the relevant information and the last one is that upcoming digital personal data protection bill may further undermine the concept of rti because this bill will restrict the sharing of the information under this bill government might restrict on the security purpose a, a particular information available to the different authorities similarly in the previous case also what we have seen is that official secret act was one of the hindrances in providing absolute information under the right to information act now personal data protection bill might further aggravate the number of services that are not being provided or the information not being provided under the rti act recently the state of rajasthan has taken the initiative of preemptive provision that is they are providing the information before a citizen demands the information through different portals and initiative government of rajasthan has created the first hand information on different portals so that it might not hinder the provision of information providing to the citizens with this discussion place now we have come to the end of today's daily news simplified thank you